The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a woman being interviewed by a market researcher in a health club about her membership of the club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh... OK, then, as long as it's quick. <laughs> Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes. OK, great. Thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand. But that's the job I'll put down on the form. And... Would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below 30, 31 to 50, and above? Over 50, <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long... Of no, is it a single-person membership? Oh, right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> thanks. And... How long have you been a member? Ooh, let me see. Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably two to three years more than that. Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is, what brought you to the club? Uh, sorry? Uh, how did you find out about the club? Did you see any ads? Well, I, I did, actually. But I have to say I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> actually, my doctor. Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure, and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition, so I signed up. Mm, great. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure. Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> it varies enormously, depending on how busy I am. Mm, of course. But on average, per month? I'd say it averages out at twice a week. OK, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that, yep. Right, thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts. Mm. And there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis? <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it. Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks. Mm. <clears throat> now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? Only about health and fitness? Anything at all. Well...
Well, I'd like to see more social events. Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but... Other things, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat, uh, was that I think they should put in, well, you know... Uh, Air conditioning. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. Mm. The rooms are really light and well-designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what, it's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So, the club should... Yeah, open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a salesman giving information to house owners about an alarm system. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Thank you for inviting me to your residence meeting. My name is Martin Pugh from Safe Cell Alarms. I'm going to explain a little bit about home security, and I hope you'll all feel a bit better informed, and perhaps that you will even purchase one of the alarms we sell. It is all too easy these days for people to break into our homes. Did you know that 25% of all burglaries are committed by burglars breaking and entering via the back door? Even though it is locked, it is still relatively easy for someone to gain entry. And there are parts of our house that we think are not vulnerable because they look inaccessible. But they're not. So, if you're trying to protect your home, you should make sure the top floor is covered by that protection, not just the ground floor. We believe that the only way to secure your property is by having an alarm fitted. Just having the alarm on the outside can put burglars off, and we also recommend that you warn them about the alarm. To do this, we suggest you stick a sign in the front window of the house so it can be seen clearly. This alone should be enough to dissuade a burglar before they start. Now, our company has a range of alarms on offer, and I brought several along for you to see tonight. But let me just explain a few things about them. First of all, all of our alarms are highly visible. They're colored red, and on the underneath, there is a blue light, which you can see whether they are switched on or not. This acts as a deterrent to burglars who can see it as an active alarm system. Like most systems, our alarms are very sensitive, so you do need to look after them. You may be surprised to hear that a cat can often slink around unnoticed under the infrared beams, but a spider crawling across them will set them off. Also, our system is a little different from some. 
Most companies offer an option that connects their alarms to the police station. All our alarms have an automatic link to our company office. This means we can deal with a situation promptly and can sort out any alarms that have gone off by mistake. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. OK, let me tell you about the installation of our alarms. Later on, I'll show you some house plans and diagrams of how the alarms operate. But you don't have to worry about them being intrusive, as we normally put them in hallways rather than individual rooms. The diagrams show you how the beams work to cover the whole house in this way. Oh, one small thing while I remember is don't leave your security code in your house. A lot of people keep it in the kitchen or their study, but we suggest you leave it with a neighbor so that if there is a break-in, the burglars can switch the system off. Now, regarding the practical aspects of installation, I know that many of you are out all day, and I'm afraid we don't install the alarms at weekends. But we do offer a service where we can fit the alarm system in the evenings for you. But we do charge a little bit extra for that. Finally, we do offer a range of systems, so I suggest you look at the leaflets on our prices. And please, don't be put off from investing in a more sophisticated system to protect your home as we do allow you to set up a monthly payment if it's too much in one go. Okay, now if you'd like to come forward... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a conversation between three university students, Alice, Paul, and Michelle. They are discussing various aspects of an upcoming biology assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Paul. Hi, Alice. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Paul. Where are you going with all those books? Well, I'm preparing for my marine studies paper. Really? What are you doing your paper on? I haven't even started mine. Well, since I've always been interested in communication, I wanted to take a closer look at how aquatic animals communicate. Communicates? Really, Paul? You think that's interesting? Well, yes, Alice. Actually, it's been much more interesting than I had expected it would be. I'm finding the information fascinating. I bet you'd be surprised at some of the things I've learned. Yeah, like what? Well, much of the world is covered by water, but it wasn't really until the first third of the 20th century that people even began to explore the depths of the ocean. Prior to its exploration, scientists just thought of it as a completely silent world. Of course, today we know it is full of sounds. Such as? Well, all kinds of living things in the ocean, from prawns to whales, call back and forth to each other. How do we know that prawns talk to one another? Good question. The answer is we listen to them. 
How scientists do it is through a special device called the hydrophone. Now, what a hydrophone does is convert the sound energy into electrical energy. It's a very clever device. Kind of like a water telephone? Well, yes. Quite like that, except the communication is only one way. Sounds more like spying on animals to me. Well, I suppose it is to a certain degree. Scientists can hear all kinds of sounds. Grunting, crackling, buzzing. It turns out that the ocean is quite a noisy place. Many underwater sounds have been identified, but even more still await classification. Fish in a public aquarium are quite, well, talkative. So scientists have been able to record their sounds and match them with mystery calls heard from the open sea. So who's the noisiest in the underwater world? I'll bet it's the dolphin. You're right, the dolphin is noisy. But by far the most widespread and persistent noisemakers are the smaller animals living in the sea. Not fish, but an animal that lives on the sea floor and grows no more than about five centimetres. Here, have a look at this table I've started. Ah, I see. The snapping shrimp is the noisiest sea creature. This is interesting. It makes its sharp snapping sound with its enlarged claw, which also functions like a water pistol. Yes, I was reading millions of these animals just offshore have been known to frighten people walking along the beach in Japan. And this is interesting. It says here that seahorses in an aquarium made such a loud noise that people could hear them from across the room. These little creatures are amazing. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Say, so Paul, your early research has really prompted me to get started on my own paper. You look like you've already done quite a lot of work on it, but the assignment isn't due for at least another month. Is that right? Um, let's see, Michelle. I think you may be a little wrong there. Let me get my class folder and we'll have a look. I know that our class participation is worth 30%, but what's this assignment worth? Isn't it 40%? Um, here it is. Yes. Uh, actually, it's worth 30%. It's the second assignment due later on that's worth 40%. It says here, OK, there are three pieces of assessment. There's the two assignments and the in-class feedback on student oral presentations, which forms part of assignment two. Now, it says that the first written assignment is composed of three parts. Yes, I recall the professor talking about those, especially the word length for part one. The research essay, it's 1,200, isn't it? It's due in week six? Yes, that's correct for part one, but only 800 for part two, the field study, which is due in week seven. Ah, oh, that's bad news. I thought I had much more time than that. I don't know how I could have been so wrong. I guess I need to purchase a diary or I'm going to get left behind. Yes, I write all my due dates on a monthly calendar which hangs on the wall next to my desk. I found that this has helped me to stay organised. I usually divide the project into weeks. Each week, I set aside some time for all of my assignments. For example, part three, the report on findings, isn't due till week nine, but I've already started working on it. Wow, I'm impressed. I guess you lead a pretty worry-free life. Not at all. It just means I get a little more sleep than most students around the due date of the assignment. <laughs> well, Paul, you certainly have inspired me. Yeah, me too. I'll be purchasing a desk calendar as soon as I get a chance. Well, I'm off. Alice, Michelle, it was great talking to both of you. All the best with your assignments. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about learning and bilingualism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 44 and 45. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA in fact suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons, mainly because it didn't take into account other factors such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well... Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. 
So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the result of the experiment suggests that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So, in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So, that's a very different story from the early research. So, what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.